This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your Ask the Expert host, Steph Storer, and I'm delighted to be here today to discuss one of my favorite, maybe not Tudor related topics, but hundreds of years before the Wars of the Roses and the Tudor's Dynasty, we can find the Normans and the very first Plantagenet king. This was a period of instability and uncertainty that we like to call the anarchy. And here to discuss this fascinating time, we have with us historian Chris Riley joining us to answer some of your questions. So thank you so much for joining us, Chris. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. We definitely got a lot of questions from our listeners. So we will kick things off right away with a quick overview, I think. Let's talk about the anarchy. What is it? How did it begin? How did it end? Yeah, I mean, the simplest questions are usually the, the biggest to answer, aren't they? Um, so the, the anarchy is a essentially, in a nutshell, a almost two decade long civil war uh, in England and, and Normandy um, between 1135 and 1153 uh, ish on the years. It, obviously, it starts um, it starts around uh, the 1130s and ends in the 1150s. Um, in a nutshell, uh, again, it's between two rival claimants to the throne of England and then kind of by default uh, the Duchy of Normandy, but I'm sure we'll touch on on Normandy and its uh, strange place in, in all of this uh, later. Um, the two claimants are the Empress Matilda, the only surviving um, legitimate heir of uh, Henry I of England, the youngest son of William the Conqueror, um, and her, her cousin, uh, Stephen of Blois, who was the favourite nephew of Henry I. Essentially, uh, obviously, there is two rival claims, rival camps, um, that over the, you know, a 20-year period, there is intermittent fighting, um, you know, court intrigue, that kind of stuff that goes on um, that ultimately kind of ends in a very strange way. But again, I'm not going not gonna to spoil too much. Uh, it doesn't necessarily end in the way that I think most people would probably think uh, the, the, the anarchy ends. But um, and speaking of which, in terms of the name, the anarchy, um, it wasn't really referred to as the anarchy at the time, as with most things medieval. Um, it was given this name much later by the Victorians who give us things like the Wars of the Roses, even the Plantagenet. Um, you know, the, these terms were coined much later. Um, but it was still, you know, like you said in, in your introduction, a, a period of immense um, disruption at the very least. How anarchical it was, I'm sure we'll touch on that later in the, uh, in the episode. You mentioned that Matilda was the only surviving legitimate child. So obviously, I think that that lends us to have to talk about how everybody else died. And so I think that we're going to have to go into the white ship just a little bit. Yes. The Does white that sound? OK, so why don't you tell us about the white ship? Yeah, the, the white ship is is arguably the most probably the most ironically, the most important part of the whole anarchy. Um, considering it happened, um, you know, my maths is terrible, 15? Yeah, 15 years before um, Henry I uh, of England dies. So um, Henry I of England comes to the throne in the year 1100 after a hunting accident, we'll call it, um, with his brother um, William II, William Rufus. Um, his reign is considered um, fairly peaceful. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good reign in terms of um, medieval uh, as far as medieval uh, reigns go. Um, but Henry's famous for two things, uh, the way he dies, which I'll touch on later, and having the record for the most illegitimate children of any English or British monarch since um, or, or prior to him uh, ascending to the throne. He has at least, I think there's about 24 illegitimate children that he has. Um, he only has two legitimate children. I've already mentioned uh, Matilda, who is his uh, daughter, who at the age of about eight years old was married into um, the um, the Roman Empire, we'll call it. Uh, it's you know, more commonly referred to as the Holy Roman Empire, but it wasn't referred to at the time. Um, so she was you know, sent off to Germany um, to you know, create, uh, create an alliance between England and the Germans. Um, and she had a brother called William, um, sometimes referred to as William Adeling or William Aethling. Uh, basically, Adeling is a anglicized version of the 
old English word Etheling, which essentially means prince or noble birth. Uh, anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, the white ship. So in 1120, uh, Henry and his young son, William, um, had been campaigning in France, successful campaigning season in France, and they were returning to uh, to England. They were at uh, Barfleur, um, which is a which was one of the most well used and well known uh, crossing points. Um, you know, it's a fairly common uh, thing for people uh, to do traveling from Normandy back to England because you know lords had land in both um, in both areas, so it was fairly common. Um, so Henry's approached by this chap who says, "Look, I built this boat." It's wicked. It's the best boat ever. It's massive. It's white. It's called the White Ship. Um, I'd love to take you back to England because my father was the one who took your father, William the Conqueror, um, to invade England in 1066. Uh, Henry says, no, you're okay. I've got my plans. I'm all good. Thank you very much. But you can take my uh, son and all of his pals, um, who at this point were getting pretty merry, um, to say the least, they were getting quite drunk. Um, so William and all of his friends, there's about 300 um, passengers in total. Uh, they get on this ship and they drink through the evening and it gets to the kind of small hours of the night um, before the ship even even kind of departs from, from Barfleur. Even the, cre- the crew uh, have been drinking as well. And essentially they are in an attempt to catch up with Henry, who's already left. Um, they run aground at hitting a giant rock that is still there at Barfleur Harbour now. Uh, it was a well-known obstacle that people were, you know, like I said, very aware of. Um, but yeah, they hit it anyway because there was so much alcohol involved that, you know, as you know, most of us know, it's it's pretty hard. To, you shouldn't drink and drive. Um, you certainly shouldn't row and drive. Unfortunately, all but one of the passengers don't survive the white ship disaster, uh, including obviously, you know, William Adeling, who, who drowns uh, after trying to get back uh, to save his one of his many half sisters from drowning, um, the only person that does survive is ironically probably the um, poorest member of the entire party. He was a butcher who was chasing some debts, uh, and because he was clothed properly, a sense in in sheepskin and, and goatskin, he was able to survive. But the the prince and a lot of his uh, half siblings, a lot of these illegitimate children, and a lot of the you know leading ladies and lords of uh, England and Normandy, the, this Anglo-Norman, the flower of Anglo-Norman society, were, were, were unfortunately uh, drowned in the uh, English Channel. Famously, one person that didn't get on the white ship, who was meant to, was Stephen of Blois. Uh, Stephen had a bout of stomachache, so the story goes, so didn't actually leave on the ship that ultimately would have probably cost him his life, ergo may have saved us from the anarchy or it would have altered history considerably fast forward uh, a few years matilda is back in normandy after her husband henry v the holy roman emperor not the one from agincourt uh, unfortunately dies of what we think was cancer and she's back now essentially as her father's only legitimate heir um what's really important about the terminology here is henry never refers to Matilda as his heir, he only refers to her as his successor, which will play into things that we're going to obviously, I'm assuming, discuss later in terms of uh, Matilda as a person as, and as a woman. But yeah, you know, fast forward to uh, roughly 1127. At this point, she's been remarried to uh, a chap called Geoffrey of Anjou, Geoffrey Plantagenet, as he's later known as, a, um, a bit of a rival to the to the Normans. They didn't really get on the Angevins and the Normans. They didn't get on. They were rivals for, you know, claims in similar areas. Uh, and this wasn't a very, very popular move, but it did make sense. And I understood why, I understand, sorry, why, uh, why Henry did it. Essentially, in a nutshell, the white ship robbed Henry of not only his only son, which is obviously going to be terrible, but also his succession. Um, the, the entire succession plan went out of the window and now he was faced with a completely alien situation that very few uh, kings wanted to, let's be honest, you know, wanted to be faced with, which was, you know, a daughter on the throne, potentially. Right. That sounds terrible, a daughter on the throne. <laughs> but So let's talk a little bit about something that you had just mentioned about how he had said he wouldn't call her his heir. 
he would only refer to her as uh, his successor because our next question from our next listener was wondering a little bit about why Henry was so adamant that Matilda should be queen because I suppose since, since there had never been a woman on the throne before, he could probably have made the argument to name someone else, but he did want it to be her. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And then kind of in that, maybe talk about why he used the terminology that he used. Yeah, and, and that's a great question, actually. And it's one that I've, I've genuinely asked myself uh, previously when thinking about the anarchy, because in a sense, if we put our medieval hats on for a second, it doesn't really make sense. Like, you know, you've said there, the thought of a, a female ruler, it wasn't like, it wasn't as if it was frowned upon. It was just not done. It wasn't a thing that people expected or had any experience of. Yes, there's the the, the odd occasion where it did happen. But I think one thing that's really important to remember when we're talking about this entire period that, you know, there are slight, there are parallels again to the, you know, like Mary the First and things like that, where, you know, Mary the First is the, the next attempt at this, essentially, you know, like what, four, 500, you know, nearly half a millennia since Matilda, we, you know, that's the next time it's tried. Um, I find it really, really important that Henry does decide that he he has to have a member of his blood um, sitting on the throne. And I think if we think about it from a personal point of view, he inherited from his brother who inherited from his father, he would want a direct descendant to inherit. Um, and I, but I think it does show that to Henry, his 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 daughter was more important than um, the kind of um, what's the word the um, kind of not stereotypes, but the the, the assumptions around female rule. Um, it, the fact that Matilda was obviously we know now that Matilda was a a, a well trained politician. She uh, the education she received in, in Germany and Italy as empress a title that she uh, very stubbornly kept through her whole life. She was an, an astute politician, strategist, um, and, and um, probably not that we get much indication, but would share some, some pretty decent insights on, on warfare and, and, and military tactics. I think in terms of the terminology, I think the main reason for that is kind of counter to the, the whole point I've just made, is that she couldn't be his heir because she was a woman. So by saying, oh, no, 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 she's not my heir, she's just my successor, essentially whilst somebody else, i.e. a male heir, is, is found, for context, uh, Henry I's, and a bit of a spoiler here, everybody from this point onwards is probably called Matilda or Henry. Um, Henry's first wife was called um, Matilda. She was originally called Edith, but changed her name to Matilda because there isn't enough Matildas in this story. She dies. Sure, sure. We find that in almost every episode that w yeah. when we start talking about people, everyone they know is the same name. <laughs> I, I always say it's like they had a sale on Henry's and Matilda's at this point because literally 50% of the people seem to have exactly the same name. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, his first wife um, dies um, just before the White Ship, I think in 1118. Um, and he does remarry again to a much younger woman called Adeliza. Um, and I think Henry's logic in saying successor and why he was still so keen to keep Matilda there on the throne is he assumed one of two things was going to happen. He was going to live long enough to see Matilda produce a son, a natural male successor through the original line, or he would have a son again through with Adeliza. Um, Neither of these two things kind of happened. Adelisa never had a child with Henry I. She did go on to have uh, a family of her own after uh, she um, wasn't married to the king anymore. And um, Matilda did have um, her own children. And she did have a son born in 1133. And I'll give you 10 points if you can guess his name. Oh, boy. Henry? Got it in one. There we go. Shockingly. <laughs> right. Um, her first son was called Henry, um, with a second being called Geoffrey after their father. Um, but Henry was born, he was only two, three years old when his grandfather, Henry I, died. So 
you know, maybe, you know, Matilda had, uh, sorry, Henry had this idea that she, he would live long enough to see the young Henry, the, um, no, no spoilers. Um, the, the young Henry, his grandson, grow up to be at least a teenager um, to then take the throne as with his mother as regent, as queen regent, which was, you know, a fairly common thing. It happens throughout history um, pre and post the anarchy. So I think that was kind of his thinking in both keeping Matilda as the heir unofficially and using the word successor as like a carryover, kind of like, uh, I don't know, when a vice president takes over from a president. Um, yes, they are seen as obviously a full president, but it's slightly different. Um, like we know it's different, um, but maybe it's just down to kind of terminology and things like that. Okay. So then maybe this kind of brings me to a, a side question here. Do you think that it would have been more unusual since we're, since we're looking at hypotheticals here, things that have never happened before, there'd never been a female successor or a female heir before if he was so concerned about making sure that it was his own bloodline, would it have been more or less unusual than to just name one of his illegitimate sons if they were actually his son, because they were still a boy. Either way, it was something that you didn't do, you know, name a girl or name a son that was illegitimate. Do you have any feelings on that? Yeah. I think, I think, again, this is a really interesting question because famously one of the most famous illegitimate children in all of medieval history is henry's own father william the conqueror who was known as william the bastard before he was william the conqueror um he was the illegitimate uh, son of his father and you know less than you know two generations what is it 60 ish years after the conquest i told you my math is terrible that's probably way out um I didn't refer to you as a mathematician, so you're all you're in the clear. <laughs> and if anybody ever does, then yeah, they need to have a strong word with themselves. Oh yeah, um, yes. Yeah, so, you know, two generations after you know William the Bastard becomes William the Conqueror of both Normandy and of England. Like nobody really bats an eyelid at that. But this is where we start to get um, ideas of primogeniture. Um, and things like that. A bit of a caveat on primogeniture. Primogeniture is the um, right of a essentially the firstborn son um, to pretty much inherit everything from their father. Not necessarily everything in terms of minor titles, but usually the top title goes to the firstborn son. This isn't the same in Normandy, and it isn't the same anywhere else. It's different everywhere. But we're starting to get this idea that the firstborn legitimate son is, you know, the one that should inherit. So. There are sons, illegitimate sons, famously uh, Robert of Gloucester, who is a character who kind of appears throughout this story, um, who would have probably made a fantastic uh, king. Um, but tastes have changed. Um, whereas, like I said, you know, two generations prior, the thought of a illegitimate son ascending to a dukedom or, or, or a full kingdom was probably a bit strange, but not out of the question. Now it's it's a it's a big no no. So he does end up naming Matilda and he's going around and telling, you know, the barons and all the high higher blooded people to make sure to pledge their allegiance to her. Fast forward, another little spoiler here. Uh, they do not keep their word when Henry passes away. So why do you think that, that they felt comfortable enough to, to do that, to turn their backs on, you know, well, I guess it would be the new queen or who's going to be the new queen. Yeah. Is that not, you know, treason? Yeah. I mean, you would think, wouldn't you? Obviously, again, back to William the Conqueror, one of his reasons for invading England is he he accuses Harold Godwinson of breaking an oath, um, which for the Christian world is, you know, one of the worst things you can do. You know, your promise is your word and everything like that. So, yeah, I think if we look at it objectively, yes, it should have probably been considered, you know, that level of of, of treason. I think the one thing that stops it being treason is the fact that Matilda's only a woman. And I'm not saying that for, as, as my, my opinion, you know, I'm, I'm saying how, how they would have seen her. Um, she was, you know, yes, she was selected as the successor, but is she really the right person for the job? I'm assuming that's what they were probably asking themselves. A bit of a, a, a tidbit that I have to mention because it's my favorite, uh, one of my favorite medieval deaths, which if anybody has those, then 
Um, it's not just me. Um, Henry the First famously died uh, in 1135 from eating a surfeit of, a surfeit of lampreys, um, which to you and me is just very, 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 very rich eels. And I couldn't think of a worse way to go. Eels anyway are horrible, but you know, eating so many that you just die um, is is is. I don't want to say comicable, comicable, but you know, a thousand years has passed. We can we can potentially laugh at Henry the First now. We can, we can laugh at him. So you're saying that his death was consuming too many eels? Because I think that I thought that it was a bad one or a rancid one or something. But we're talking about liter- just the sheer volume of eels. <laughs> I that hope it's him. sheer volume. I mean, I think it could kind of be a combination. I think it's probably a combination of the two. Uh, not to go too much of on a tangent, but lampreys were the kind of the food of the elite. Uh, and Henry, for some reason, had this fascination with with eating these horrendous eels. Um, and he either ate too many, and one of them was bad, or he just ate so many that um, he just could not consume anymore and simply keeled over. Um, but I think it's important that people know just how Henry I died. I think that that was a really important tidbit. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing that. <laughs> And clearing up any misconceptions about whether or not it was one bad one or several good ones. <laughs> so tell us a little bit now about Matilda's capture. And then we can go a little bit after that into her impressive escape. But the capturing of Matilda is where we want to go with the next part of this. Yeah. So just to kind of go back slightly, a kind of few more key events in, 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 in the anarchy. Well, see, I've already mentioned Henry I dies from eating too many eels in 1135. At this point, Stephen is in a much better position. He's able to claim the throne physically before Matilda can. He races to Winchester where his brother is, uh, his brother Henry, obviously. Um, is Bishop. I have to point out here that you said he's in a better position. And earlier we talked about how he didn't get on the white ship because of his stomach ache. And I feel like there's a general theme in this just conversation today is that all these guys just have really weak stomachs that prevent them from having the life that they were supposed to have. Yeah. I mean, you should be able to eat as many lampreys as you want and continue. You should. You should. And you should be able to sail away without, (laughs) you know, these little tummy aches that you have. Um, But (laughs) but I would would assume Stephen would say it's probably, um, obviously he would give credit to uh, the almighty, but probably give it to some luck as well. But um, yeah, Stephen was very well placed physically. He was much closer to England um, than Matilda, who was also recovering from a pretty traumatic uh, pregnancy and birth with uh, her son, Henry. Um, but yeah, Stephen Lands, his brother is Bishop of Winchester, Henry of Winchester. Um, he is crowned King of England on the 22nd of December, 1135, just three weeks after his uncle's death. After the first few years, there isn't really much of a war. It's kind of just um, Stephen's trying his best to solidify his claim he throws lots of lavish parties holds court you know like yeah i'm totally the king 100 percent. nobody else is going to get involved it's all mine don't worry henry said so fast forward for a few years it does kick off obviously held hence why i'm talking to you right now to be fair to matilda her and her brother robert of gloucester who i mentioned previously are doing pretty well and they managed to um, basically control the entire southwest of England around the city of Bristol, which was a pretty impregnable uh, fortress. Again, fast forward to 1141. We have the um, very famous Battle of Lincoln that nobody knows pretty much anything about. So it's not really, it can't really be that famous. Um, but as with everything in this period, nobody knows anything about anything. We have like three sources for like you know, the Battle of Hastings. So yeah, the, the Battle of Lincoln in 1141 is kind of a key turning point. Uh, Stephen is captured and you'd think at this point the war is over, but it's not. It goes on for a little bit longer. Um, Matilda is then basically granted this title, ironically by Stephen's brother, Henry, uh, again, who's, who's the Bishop of Winchester, a very important church figure. Uh, he grants her the title Lady of the English. And this is another really important point as well. Um, because the word queen already exists and what a queen does is already associated with ruling in, in place, not place of a man, but with a male counterpart, i.e. a king, it didn't feel right to give her this title of queen. Anyway, she's 
unofficially granted this title of Lady of the English, which had been used previously. Um, Ethelfled of Mercia back in the 9th century was given a similar, uh, similar title. Um, she's on her way to London. She gets to London. And I really can't work out this next bit. I've never really found a source that explains properly what happened, but she's about to be crowned um let's for let's use the word monarch you know she's crowned as a monarch i don't know what word they would have used um and just on the eve of this she is she somehow manages to really annoy the the citizens of london um and she is sent packing um and her and her army um which is led by robert of gloucester is uh, thoroughly battered um at winchester and she then runs to oxford um where she is then laid siege to by uh, Stephen. Um, at this point, Robert has also been captured, um, you know, displaying all the chivalric qualities that was expected. She, he held a rear guard as Matilda was able to escape. Um, but yeah, she gets to Oxford and basically the, the game's up. There is no real chance that she is able to get herself out of this in a winning position. So uh, in the dead of night, it's the middle of December at this point, um, and it is you know, I'm assuming the temperatures got down to, you know, around um, zero, uh, at least, you know, in in in, uh, in centigrade. So it was pretty cold. She escaped over a frozen lake and she was able to somewhat recoup her position. But ultimately, um, you know, this is kind of uh, end of 1142, early 43. And she has to withdraw back to Normandy. But I think it shows her tenacity and her um genuine bravery um you know somebody comes to you and says look um the king's outside with his army you're being besieged as probably as a um as a traitor to the crown because at this point she's attempted to have herself crowned which stephen could probably use as a you know a way to probably have her executed at this point even though a she's a woman and b that's not really what we did to to highborn uh, nobles so to you know make that decision to go right okay let's go let's try and escape do it in the dead of night in the dead of winter over a frozen lake yeah you know um the girl's got guts i'll give her that so we're going to jump forward a little bit now to the just quote succession of uh after stephen so i'm i'm leading you a little bit here to give us some information about why it ended up not being his son and it ended up being someone else, which I'll let you tell us. How did, how did they name the next heir after Stephen? Yeah, so for context, Stephen had a son called Eustace. Um, Eustace was pretty much the same age as Matilda's son, Henry. Um, and, you know, as we all would assume, as as is today, Eustace was the the heir apparent, you know, the, he was to be the king assumed anyway, after Stephen, um, you know, like I mentioned, um, after kind of 1142, 43, Matilda's kind of had to accept that she's probably not going to be able to sit herself on the throne of England. Uh, don't get me wrong. You know, successes have been had, um, the Duke, the, uh, the Duchy of Normandy has been captured um, by her husband, Geoffrey of Anjou, and her brother, Robert, who does return to help solidify um, Normandy. But she has to accept that, she, you know, she was so close in uh, 1142. She had the king captured and, you know, if she couldn't get it done then, she, you know, she, she wasn't going to get it done. Um, as much as S Stephen was a was a likable king, he was he seemed like a, a nice chap. He he was um, he wasn't a tyrant, uh, and I think to a to 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 his to his discredit that that kind of didn't help him out because um, you kind of had to be at this point. Anyway, we 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 move forward a few years into the late later eleven forties, and um, Henry Fitz Empress, who what he was known as, or Henry of Anjou, was you know a teenager. Um, he was angsty. He was looking for something to do, probably. Like there was no corn or Limp Biscuit albums to listen to, so he didn't have that. So he decided to um invade England as literally a teenager. It didn't go well. Um, but the seeds were sown for an alternative. And later, um, when he's a little bit more seasoned, he's um, you know, in his late teens now, in eleven fifty-three, 
he reinvades England with a mercenary army, pretty much consolidates his power again around the southwest, around Bristol and most of the north, cornering Stephen around London, which had always been um, very much like staunchly loyal to to Stephen. And at this point, it is agreed. Uh, there is a peace treaty signed um, in 1153 that um, Stephen would adopt Henry Fitzempress as his son and successor and heir, um, basically just removing his own actual son, uh, Eustace, from the succession, which, uh, as I'm sure we all would, he wasn't best pleased about that. And he did kind of um, kick up a bit of a fuss, but then ironically, and I truly believe completely coincidentally, um, Eustace dies uh, at the, the end of 1154, taking that potential, you know, the anarchy too. And like, nobody likes a sequel, do they? So I don't think it would have been better um, if Eustace had have survived. Um, so in a sense, uh, everything kind of came back around. And what I really like, I'm a sucker for continuity in my history. I really like it when a father is succeeded by their, you know, their eldest eldest son or, or daughter, if it's Matilda, because I'm team Matilda. Um, so the fact that it comes round to uh, Henry again being the heir to essentially his grandfather's throne, um, because I think at this point, after nearly 20 years of, you know, fighting here and there, people were sick of it. People were just beyond sick of people building castles and people building castles to counter the castles. You know, there was there was a, a general sense of uneasiness and people just wanted an end to it. So, you know, we've got this young, uh, hot-headed Angevin prince with his, um, you know, his new wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Everybody that knows me knew I was going to mention her at some point in this episode. Um, they saw this this new pair, this power couple of European politics, uh, an aging king, and they thought, you know what, here's what it is. We we tried, um, and it all kind of like I said, it all kind of comes full circle, and it's back to um, this Norman Angevin line um, with this Stephen of Blois sprinkling for a few years. It's funny that you say that about Eleanor of Aquitaine because. I would have loved to talk about her today because I feel the same way as you do, but it just happened to be the anarchy's turn, but we'll have to have you back to talk about her again because I do love her. But when you said a few minutes ago that you truly believe uh, that it was pure coincidence that Eustace passed away, um, I think that that was you answering the next question (laughs) that I have. So that's the answer is that you believe it to be coincidence, but I know that there, there are some whispers that there was some foul play suspected around his death. So even though that's not what you think happened, tell us a little bit about maybe some of the theories. Yeah. I mean, it it was always going to be questioned, you know, wasn't it? He's, he's a young man. Um, he's the heir to the throne that's just been disinherited. It just so happens that he, 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 you know, he dies, of apparently no real reason. He just kind of gets ill and dies. Um, I think poisoning is the main thing people quite probably quite accurately assume happened. Um, I think the reason that I go to the genuine, you know, accident, you know, horrendous tragedy of of somebody dying uh, at such a young age is there isn't really any real claims against um, Henry, who later becomes Henry II of England. Um, and then again, <laughs> kind of coincidentally again later, you know, just, you know, a few months later in 1154, Stephen himself dies because when the original PC, uh, treaty is signed in 1153, uh, Stephen is allowed to stay on as king and Henry is his heir. Um, something similar we, that we see with Henry V in France, um, you know, much later, um, is they become the heir to a kingdom rather than, okay, now it's your turn again very, very nicely for, for this, for Henry II, that he becomes Henry II, um, both his, his predecessor and his greatest rival die, uh, leaving the, uh, the door completely open for him to just walk in. And there isn't just, there just really isn't anyone saying, I wonder if Henry of Anjou had Eustace of Boulogne killed. I'm sure there was people talking at the time, especially in the taverns and, things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, it's a, it's a good coincidence if you're, if you're pro Plantagenet, 
it's it's a convenient coincidence i think if you are pro um house of blois when we reflect on this period of history we are often looking at it or even just talking about um you know how we were saying the barons were were you know pledged their allegiance to her and then went back on it and and which of the nobles died in the white ship so we're looking at a lot of the uh, upper levels of society how did the anarchy affect regular common people it's were they as affected by the situation or did they kind of just see it unfolding and wait until something happened? I mean, it's a great question. And it's one, unfortunately, that I just don't think we'll ever truly be able to answer. Um, because, you know, anybody that knows anything about, you know, medieval European history is um, a history is written by the victors anyway. Uh, but also in this period, it's written by the church. Um, and the church don't really care about two things. They don't care about poor people and they don't care about women. And the anarchy was kind of about both those things. Um, so we have reports from people like William of Malmesbury, who is a famous um, uh, clerical historian, let's call him, of the period, um, talking about, um, and there are, there are others, uh, others like William, who talk about the period that we call the anarchy, um, the years where Christ and his angels slept, i.e. it was completely void of any kind of spiritual guidance, which is so important at this time. Um, and if we read that source or sources like it, it's quite easy to go, well, it must have been just the worst time ever. Um, you know, there's people, you know, building castles, there's robber barons running around the place. But realistically, if we look at the actual warfare and what we know about the effects it had, it was pretty sporadic. And it was around the places, you know, it was around Bristol, it was around London. Um, it was quite a lot in the north as well. Um, big up the north. Um, so in the places that it was affected, it was affecting, people were probably quite affected, but in the vast majority of the country, I'm assuming no one really cared who was king or queen. Um, you know, whether it was Stephen and his queen Matilda, or, you know, it was Empress Matilda. Um, I don't think anybody really minded. I think one of the big things that is really important here, well, two things actually, is the importance of just general peace. You know, everybody knows about the Middle Ages and the medieval period is that it was it was a dangerous time to be alive. Yes, there are the tropes of the Dark Ages that I do my best personally to, to kind of dispel, but it was still a dangerous time. And uh, consistency and peace uh, promised by stable government was probably top of their list. Uh, and the second thing is, and it's probably why Stephen was so readily accepted by the barons, is the, the idea of interregnum i.e. the period between monarchs. Up until the 13th century, there was this, the accepted um, kind of, the rule that was accepted was until a new monarch is crowned, there is no government. So the periods between, that three-week period between Henry I dying and Stephen being crowned, there was a period where there was no law. Um, so that was also very important as well. So having a king or a monarch was probably more important than who the actual person was. Um, and like I said, it wasn't until um, Edward I becomes king um, in 1274. His father, Henry III, dies in um, 1272. There's a two-year period technically where there isn't a king. Um, it's also where we get the um, the phrase, and I can never remember which way around it is, but essentially, long live the king, God save the king, because that basically says, thanks for the last one, here's to the new one. Um, it removes that interregnum period that at this point in history um, was probably quite scary for both the barons and the regular folk. That was a nice little interesting tidbit as well, the, the long live the king. I don't think I ever thought about where that came from, and I don't think I ever thought to ask. So <laughs> thank you for that. No problem. Okay, well, our next question uh, will throw in a little bit of pop culture for you. I'm not sure if you watch the, you know, Sensation House of Drag, House of the Dragon, House of Dragon, the prequel to HBO's Game of Thrones. We've read, I mean, uh, definitely people that are into history and things like that have have come to realize that Game of Thrones was kind of modeled around the Wars of the Roses. And recently I read an article, and you don't really even need to read about it. You can just watch it to pick up on it, that House of Dragon is actually also kind of modeled after the anarchy. 
So I was wondering if, well, A, if you even watch the show and if you do, what similarities do you see or have you heard or things like that? So um, just so that we can put it into kind of some context. Yeah, I think so. For context, I am a massive Game of Thrones fan, except the last season, which I'm pretty sure anybody that's actually watched the show would probably agree with. Absolutely. 100% on that Some one. Some of the worst TV I've ever watched. Um, but I haven't actually watched um, any of the House of Dragon yet. But having said that, I've spoke to a lot of my friends about it who have already managed to watch it. And, you know, they tell me how great it is. And it's like, oh, it's such a great story. I'm like, yeah, it's a great story because it happened. Um, you know, I'd heard that it was based on the anarchy. And I'm like, wow, this is this is great. You know, I really want a, if anybody's watched uh, the Last Kingdom on Netflix. I think a show about uh, the white ship disaster and the anarchy would be a wonderful TV show. In a sense, George R. R. Martin's already written that, but he has dragons. Um, I think the parallels I've heard and I've kind of been told about is there is a, a you know, there's, there's the fact that there is a strong female claimant um, who is, you know, chosen by her father, from what I've been told again, is is a clear parallel um, to Matilda. I'm a massive fan of Matilda. I think she's and this whole period is massively undertaught and undersold. So I hope people listening to this hear this and go, cool, I'm definitely going to check out um, The House of Dragon. Uh, I'm definitely going to read uh, Charles Spencer's book, The White Ship. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into this period of history because it's so entertaining. You know, that's, that's kind of why we're here. But I tweeted a couple of weeks ago or last week, something like that, about the fact that House of Dragon is based on the anarchy. I hope... I really, truly hope that it gets more people into medieval history um, as the original Game of Thrones potentially got people into kind of uh, late um, medieval history, which, um, again, another wonderful period of history that is massively undersold, even though it's the War of the Roses, which is like probably the most well, well-taught well thing in this country, in the UK. Um, the more the merrier for me. And I will watch it. Um, I just haven't found the time, unfortunately, to uh, to get it watched. Okay, before I let you go, it's been an awesome, you know, 45 minutes or so together. And I think that we've touched upon a lot of things here in uh, our chat about the anarchy that, that we, you know, we answered all the questions from the listeners, and you've given us a lot more than we, than we even knew we wanted. So it's been a great, a great chat. Thank you so much. But before I let you go, I want to give you the chance to maybe plug some of your upcoming events or anything that you want to share with our listeners so that we can continue to support you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, something that would be, um, I would love to talk about is something that I'm very passionate about, which is uh, Northern history. I, you know, the North of England, um, for those that don't know, is kind of left out of the history book sometimes. It's, um, everybody knows London, but nobody knows what's up here. And I absolutely love being from this part of the world. Um, and myself and some uh, other people from the kind of uh, social media history community, uh, my friend uh, Rosie and Josh, um, we are hosting our very, very first um, part of our Northern History Festival um, exhibit. It's about the Blitz during the Second World War uh, and how it affected northern towns and cities. We really want to put the North back on the history map. Um, um, but in terms of my other stuff, you can always find me uh, on Instagram at Chris Riley History or on Twitter at Chris Rye History because Twitter's got a weird name shortening thing. Um, but yeah, you can find links to all my work, including the Historians Magazine, which I'm very, very proud to be a part of as well. Um, we've just released our Revolutions, Rebellions and Revolts edition. I've definitely got those three the wrong way around. Uh, and there is an article on the anarchy in there. So if you do want some more information on that, you know, it's free to read online as well. Um, again, all the links can be found on my social media. Um, and also, you know, feel free to message me if I got anything wrong about the anarchy. If you want to know more about the anarchy, please talk to me about Eleanor of Aquitaine. I can never get enough. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Steph, for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Again, this is Chris Riley here today with us talking about the anarchy. And again, thank you to our listeners who wrote in with all the questions. As always, we couldn't do it without you. And thank you to everyone who's listening to this week's episode. We appreciate your support and we hope you'll turn it, tune in again next time. As we continue to ask the experts the pressing questions you all want answered. If you love the Tudor's Dynasty podcast and want to show even more support, please consider becoming a patron where you'll not only receive the great content we offer now, but extra insider research, 
info, prizes, and other exciting opportunities only offered by subscribing. So until next time, I'm your host, Steph Soar, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.